This is something that uh, Spurgeon said. Uh, he said, uh, I call this the counter-influence in prayer. Satan is sure to hinder Christians when they're earnest in prayer. Have you not frequently found, dear friends, when you've been most earnest in supplication that something or other will dart across your mind to make you seize from the exercise? I have been painfully conscious of a counter-influence urging me to seize from such petitions. Um, this one I call the unwanted blasphemies. This is also Spurgeon. Uh, Satan at such times has been known to pour into the poor troubled mind floods of blasphemy. I do not recollect as a child having heard blasphemy, carefully brought up and kept out of harm's way, yet I distinctly remember the spot where the most hideous blasphemies that ever passed through the human mind rushed through my mind. He's talking, he experienced that while he was in prayer. And um, this one is, oh, hold your finger in Luke. Go to Revelation. Go to Revelation 8. I just want you to look at this real quick. Revelation 8. And start in verse 3. And it says, And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer. And there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with, notice that, the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. And there were voices, thunderings, lightnings, and an earthquake. You know, this is some insight to what happens when we pray. What starts as an audio or even a mental prayer, once reaching heaven, it's downloaded into a different type of file, an incense file. Then it's ignited and portrayed to God the Father in the form of smoke like a cloud. And then in verse 5, your prayers are poured upon the world of God-denying reprobates by God Himself. You know, your, your prayers are a lot more powerful than you may think. And I, I know um, a lot of times you, when you get around street preachers, people that love handing out tracts, winning souls, uh, there's a tendency to get very works-based, works performance. You know, um, I, I was just preaching last week, and the, it's great to do those things. We encourage those things. It's, it, it, you need that stuff in your life, but if you haven't, if you haven't gotten filled up by God before you're going out, on, you know, you are unbalanced. Right. Yeah. And, and I mean, it's great to go help people win soul. That's great. But I mean, did you talk to God? Did you even pray to ask him help you win a soul that day? I mean, I mean, do you, you think you're the one doing it? <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I understand God uses vessels, but it's not without God using it. You understand? <laughs> you know? So anyway, let's go back to our text. We're in, we're in Luke 18. That was some kind of an introduction. <laughs> Luke 18, and I'm going to read the first eight verses. It says, uh, And he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. Whew. Saying, There was in a city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man, and there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. And he would not for a while. But afterward he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, verse 5, Yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. And the Lord said, uh, Hear what the unjust, say, unjust judge saith. Verse 7, and shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? So I wanted to just bring up just a few things. I don't know that I can add much to what's already been preached. And I, like I said, I'm, I'm very humbled to even be here. Just like every year, I'm, I'm super humbled that I keep being asked to, to come. And not just come, but to preach. You know, I just pray that the Lord will do something for all of us. But 
The first thing I want to notice here is we have a parable of purpose in verse 1 through 3. We, and there is a purpose to parables, and sometimes you can be so dispensational, you're almost like a hyper, you know, to, to where you don't even believe Jesus can talk to you anymore because it's not a Pauline epistle. You know, and, and if you believe that Jesus Christ is God, and I do, I do, I believe, I believe his words can transcend, man. I, I believe they'll be looking at those words in the millennium time. I'll be, I believe we'll be looking at those words in eternity, amen. saying, right. oh, I got something else, man. I got something else. Oh, and uh, don't be so quick to put God in a box. Amen? amen. And uh, I, I understand rightly divide, and I understand all that, but so, sometimes that stuff can suck the life out of your Christianity. Absolutely. You, you know, and, and, you know, maybe... It, I was that. I was that. I, I was that guy that would come home drunk, and I would just open the Bible, say, "God, speak to me." I, I didn't know where to start, and he would talk, and it would scare the tar out of me. <laughs> but I knew it was him. I know it was him. I wasn't rightly dividing or nothing, but I think God looked down and he's like, okay, little punk, you want to hear me talk? <laughs> you know? and, and he would talk to me, but the point is, it's his books, it, it's, it's his book, it's his words, amen, and they, they transcend time, amen, and it, that's not some excuse not to learn, you know, what's what, New Testament, Old Testament, don't be lazy, don't be stupid, you know, you got enough free schooling at your local church. I mean, you got an awesome school at TBDI. I mean, all this Amen. stuff is on the plate right in front of you. Yes. And don't be lazy. Amen. You know, but um, this parable of purpose, we first look that it's a parable with a point. And God wants to communicate to you. Have you realized that? God wants to talk to you. He wants to converse back and forth with you. You know, it's not just for a sermon outline. It's not just to sound smart in front of some guys. You know, it's not just to think that, I don't know, people think something great of you because we know, we know you better than that. You know, but, you know, but God wants to communicate with you not only through the Bible, which He does. He wants to communicate to you through the Bible. Uh, he wants to communicate to you through preaching. And He does. You know, and, and every time I come up here, you know, I, I hope it doesn't start to sound cliche, but I feel like some of the strongest experiences I've felt of the presence of God have probably been at this camp. You know, not, not just in this building, but I mean, we were talking about that small building, you know, with, with the shoes flying through the screen door. <laughs> And man, I'm running out there and I'm like, I gotta fix this screen. And then the camp organizer's coming up and I'm like, oh, we're all good here. We're all good here. You know, and, and you know, uh, they actually had chandeliers and we were so happy. We could jump up and, you know, and uh, they, they were too small to hang from, but we would have tried if they were a little bigger. You know, but, um, but God not only wants to communicate to you through the Bible and preaching, but through prayer but through prayer, you know, and um, you, you think about, um, it, it's been said, you know, the Bible's God's way of speaking to you, prayer is your way uh, to talking to God, you know, and um, well, if, what kind of relationship would you have if, the, if your partner like, never talked to you, you know, like God just laid it all out there for you, he's like, you know, I love you, you know, I've done the, all this for you. You know, I'm giving you my word. You know, we pres uh, God preserved the word of God, the King James Bible through and through. You know, martyrs have been willing to burn at the stake for it. And just all uh, world governments have tried to rid the world of this book. And yet you just lazily have it in your lap and, or in your house or on the bookshelf. And, and, and it's just like, you know, God's trying to talk. And I mean, if you can even make it around to reading, right? You know, but how about this prayer thing? You know, um, I, I know I probably wouldn't last five minutes if, if Mary Chris was talking to me and I was just like. <laughs> you know, I'd, I'd be the one up here crying, you know. <laughs> Stop hitting me. 
You know, um, Richard Dawkins, he's a famous atheist. He was asked, you know, Mr. Richard Dawkins, you know, what if you're wrong about, about, you know, God not being real? I mean, you're some famous atheist, but like, just come on, level with me here. What if you're wrong? And like, you stand before God one day. Like, what would you say? Yeah. Listen to this answer. And I, I may not be quoting it verbatim, but I'll give you basically what he said. He's like, well... If I stood before God and it all ended up being real, I would tell God, why have you gone through such extreme lengths to hide yourself from me? And I'm just, I'm just thinking like, open your stinking eyes, man. You know, I mean, I mean, if you've ever even had a kid, you know, and it held a newborn baby, I mean, maybe, maybe it's not even your kid. Maybe it's someone else's kid. You hold that little life in your hands. I mean, you can't come up here on a mountain like this and look at all this stuff and say, it's all random chance. You know, it's just, you, you know, uh, but I mean, you, you think about that, and he obviously has a motive, you know, and uh, people do have motives. And maybe you have a motive. You came up here and you have a motive. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's, I don't, I don't know. I don't even want to go there because I don't want to know what it is. But, you know, but we have a motive too. You know, you came up here and it's the preacher's motive to get you right with God. Yes. It's Pastor Kim Sr.'s motive to see something happen in all these churches that will make these California churches stronger. I'm pretty sure. He never told me that. I'm just assuming. You know, but I, I don't think he would put out all this effort for nothing. Amen. And I, and I know the, the leaders in the groups here and, and the folks overseeing the, the cabins, we are trying to put a situation where you can get right with God and go home different and change and closer to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And it's really going to be up to you what you get out of everything here. God wants to commune with you. Hold your finger there. Go to a. Uh, uh, Psalm 142. Psalm 142. And uh, I've been going through a series of messages, and I've, it's pretty much based on this verse, Psalm chapter 142. And uh, let's look at verse 1. And it says, I cried unto the Lord with my voice. With my voice unto the Lord did I make my supplication. Notice the next verse. I poured out my what? Before Him. Huh? Well, that's not very reverent. No, it's not very reverent. You know what it is? It's honest. Yeah, and, and, and God, he, He's not afraid of, of your complaints. Amen? Uh, he, 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 he would rather you come to Him about those you know, than become some stinking atheist. You know, and, and you, you, know, you know, as preachers, you, you know what we joke about with the atheists, right? It's like, God doesn't believe in atheists. <laughs> Amen? That, that's how I always answer those guys because I love seeing that pride just puff up in them. I love it, man. <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I, you got to enjoy Christianity, and that's how I enjoy it, you know? <laughs> and just don't, don't let me know that I got under your skin because I will exacerbate that, okay? <laughs> I mean, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to... Yeah. There was... When we were in New York, um, this not elderly fellow, he was probably he was probably late fifties. He he came up and he's walking with his daughter and and I said, uh, would you like something about Jesus Christ, sir? And I tried to hand him a track and he said, You know what? Uh, he just starts talking to me and he's very smart on like a school level or whatever. And um, yeah, or whatever. <laughs> um, but but essentially, he's telling me he's an atheist. And, and I'm like, okay, you're an atheist. All right, you know? And I'm like, it's a free country. You could be whatever you'd like, you know? You, you, could, you could do whatever you want, you know? You could be an atheist. And he was just mad that I was like, okay with him being an atheist. And I'm, I'm like, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm not an atheist, you know? And, and he's like, but you have no proof. And I was like, I'm the proof. I'm the proof. I, I live the proof every day. And, and he's telling me, he's like, you know, the only reason you're a Christian is because you're raised in a Christian country and your parents are Christian and all this blah, 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 blah. And I was like, uh, my, my parents weren't Christian. My dad was an alcoholic. I grew up on drugs. 
You know, oh, but Randy, you said he drug you to church. He did drug me to church. He didn't know what to do either. He's trying to get off alcohol. and uh, He didn't know what to do. Yeah. And it's like, by that time, you know, I was already older. I was already a teenager. I did not grow up like a lot of you guys. Like, praise the Lord for your upbringing. Amen. Amen. You know, but all of his little arguments were so cliche. I was like, that ain't me. That ain't me. That ain't me. And I'm sorry, I still believe in Jesus. Yeah. You know, and, and his little daughter there. Now, okay, let me fast forward just a little bit. This black fellow comes up, and he has glasses on. And this guy's super educated. I didn't know what was going on at first, so I'm just kind of watching. This guy starts debating him, like, college-level stuff about why God's real. And I'm just sitting there like... And, like... I'm not looking for a sign, Dr. Walker, but I was looking at his glasses like, like, is he an angel? And I'm not looking for that, but he never told me his name. You know, but, but this guy essentially just handed the dude his rear end. And he said, you understand by even using the word God, you're admitting that he exists? And, and I was like, that's good. You know, and I was just sitting there and... And anyway, the guy's like, well, I got to go. And, and he ran off. And it was just me and, and the atheist guy. So in the, in the midst of this little conversation, the atheist became an agnostic. Like, he's like, well, I don't really know. And I, and I was like, well, you're not an atheist. I mean, we, we can at least agree on that much. You can at least say you don't know now. You know? And, and uh, well, and this guy ended up being married to a Christian. And his little daughter's sitting there listening to her daddy argue up and down. And unfortunately, I mean, it's not like we didn't destroy the guy. You know, this was my heart, like looking at his little girl. Like she's smiling at her daddy. She loves her daddy. I don't want to destroy that man in front of his daughter. But they were about to go on a daddy date, you know. And I'm like, bro, you've been here too long, man. You need to go have your little date with your daughter. I, I don't know. I just, I just hope she walked away and said, you know, those guys, you know, they didn't agree with daddy. They agree more with mommy. But, you know, at least they tried to tell daddy, you know. And uh, you can go out there and destroy people. And I have. I've destroyed them. I, I don't know, man. God's just been so merciful with me. I got to shift gears, bro. I got to shift gears with these people. We can't think that the first conversation is always the last. You got to make some deposits before you make some withdrawals. And you got to trust God. And how are you going to do that if you're never praying? You know, maybe you feel like you need to finish this thing right now because you don't trust God. Have you ever thought that? You ever thought about that? Because, you know what? Um, uh, hang a right. Go to Ephesians 6. In Ephesians 6... You guys are familiar with the armor here? And, uh, you know, we, we talked about, let's just look at 13. It says, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, where... By ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. What's the punctuation? Right there. Oh, it's not the end of the statement. Oh, because those are normally all you hear about. You see, right? Am I, I'm right, bro. I, th I, I see all the little kid pictures they put up on the walls. You know, the, and, but what's missing is verse 18. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Now, this is a weapon of power. So the point is, prayer is a weapon of power. It's explosive. It's exciting. It's extraordinary. 
You know, you know um, maybe your prayer life isn't what it should be because you're not doing it right. I mean, practice yes. makes what? Perfect. Perfect. You're going to get better at praying as you do it more and more. Yes. You know, and it's better to do it before you need to do it. Amen. Do, do it ahead of time. Yes. <laughs> you know, Daniel, he was doing ahead of time before he landed in a, in a lion's den. Amen. He, it was that preparatory experience. You know, it was, a, it was a, he was doing it before. He didn't just wait till he landed in some lion's den to learn how to pray. Prayer is a weapon of power, but unfortunately, prayer is weaning in popularity. You know, this answers why there's no spiritual power. You know, uh, this could answer, you know, maybe why you're getting so frustrated trying to win somebody and you can't. You know, you know um, number one, you're not trusting God. Number two, you're probably not praying to God like you should be about it. You know, and uh, maybe, maybe, the, maybe the flame has kind of grown dim. That's something else to pray about. You know, break my heart for sinners. Break my, break my heart for people going to hell. Like, like, how long has it been since I personally shed a tear over somebody splitting hell wide open? I don't, I don't know the answer for you, but I mean, I think we're all sitting in the Laodicean church in some place, and maybe it's the prayer place. You know, there's a story about Charles Spurgeon, and I know he, he didn't agree with us on everything, and we don't agree with him on everything, but he did a work of God, and I don't, I don't think really anybody with half, a cent would, with half a sense would say that God didn't use the man, you know, and he did a great work, you know, and... Uh, there's a story of him, you know, showing some guys that they kind of came to his ministry and they're like, you know, uh, Pastor Spurgeon, we'd love to just study kind of what you're, what, what's going on. We want to know. We want to look at your model and try to learn to duplicate it. And, you know, we're going to scale this and all these business phrases, right? You know, and uh, Charles Spurgeon, he's like, hey, uh, you guys want to see our powerhouse? You've heard it before. Don't, don't say it. Don't say it. Some people haven't heard it. You, you, you really want to see our powerhouse? He's like, come on. And he walks on down to this room, which to my understanding was like underneath, underneath where the preaching was. Yeah. And he opens this door and there's all these men yeah. praying. Yeah. There's all these men praying. Amen. You know, and I, I don't feel like our services are prayed for like they should be. I don't, I don't feel like our, our, our pastors are being prayed yeah. for like they should be. Yeah. I don't feel like families and marriages in our churches are being prayed for like they should be. You know, and it's shame on all of us. Yes. You know, we got something to pray about. Yes. Amen. And, and we're neglecting a weapon and we're in a real warfare. Yes, so we not only see a parable with a point, but we see a practical picture. You know, it says that in our text there in Luke 18, there was in a city a judge which feared not God. Tell me that's not practical. <laughs> <laughs> our land is I mean is I mean we got lawyers sitting in here I mean have you ever met a good judge I don't know I don't know you know but if you did meet a good judge he probably doesn't have the jurisdiction to do much for this country okay. you know he, he's probably just looking at, at drunk driving or, or you know speeding tickets and he's trying to do what, whatever he can with what little the Lord has given him jurisdiction over but the, the fact is judges by and large in our country in our cities They've fallen by the wayside, man. We are flooded with unjust judges. You know, this paints a picture of hopelessness. Just paints a picture of hopelessness. You know, there, there's no justice anymore. You, 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 you understand, like in California, if someone breaks in your house to hurt your family and you shot them in self-defense on your property, on your side of the threshold, you know, uh, you're going to go to jail. Isn't that crazy? I mean... You know, uh, uh, where we live, we have, uh, I think, is it, I don't know if it's, oh, no, it's a 99 cent store. And, and like, Randy, how do you know about that? I love 99 cent store. <laughs> I can always afford it, you know. But, but, you know, 99 cent store, to what I understand, is going bankrupt. Yes. And it's like, well, why are they going bankrupt? Well, you know, because you can steal up to like $800 worth of anything from a store, and it's just a misdemeanor. So people are literally just walking in, filling up their cart, and walking out. And it's just like, you don't understand, you idiots. These were the last people trying to help you. <laughs> you know? I mean, this was the last place we could afford, you know? <laughs> we live in California, man! That's not by the grace of God, right? <laughs> You know, 
<laughs> but, you know, he could still use us. You know, we could still do something. But you know what? Um, who's, who, uh, those who moderate the law today are lawless. You know, Psalm 11.3 says, If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Well, I know one thing they could do. They could pray. We could pray. You know, and I don't believe Trump's going to save our country. You know, I think it's too far. Uh, I don't... I'm of the personal persuasion that it ain't going to get fixed till Jesus comes back. And, and, and if, if he was on the ballot, I would vote for him. And that's just me, you know? But he's not. <laughs> they would never put him on a ballot that you could vote for. You know? I, and, you know, I think they're kind of afraid that he might get more votes than they think. You know what I'm saying? I mean, there's street people that understand, no, if Jesus was running this, man, he'd be right, you know? <laughs> I, I mean, they get that. <laughs> But we, we have this unjust judge in our practical picture, but we also have an uninvited widow. You know, you think about walking in, into a courtroom uninvited is illegal. But in a land of lawlessness, you know, it's hard to enforce anything, isn't it? Right. You know, uh, you might be found doing some things that are irregular for the Lord Jesus Christ. That maybe even the brethren are kind of wondering what the heck you're doing. And... It's between you and God. You need to follow God. That's right. If God has asked you to do something and we're kind of weirded out, we're like, whoa, that's a little bit different, bro. I mean, you know what? Uh, when a man's ways please the Lord, it will make even his enemies to be at peace with him. So, and time will tell. You know, we'll, we'll figure it out after a while. I mean, hopefully the brethren will be, have enough grace with each other to be like, you know what? He's a little different, but, you know, God did actually use him, you know what I mean? <laughs> You know, maybe he's kind of crazy enough that God would use him. Amen. You know, and in some ministries we think about uh, that are kind of frowned upon, unfortunately, you know, maybe, maybe that crazy guy is there and he's the only guy that would be willing to do the work. Amen. You know what I'm saying? Come on. Amen. I want to be dumb enough to do the work. Amen. I want to be stupid enough to have nowhere else to go. Amen. I got nowhere to go but my Lord. Amen. You can't comfort me. I can't go for you. Right. You need the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. And I've had to live in the backside of the Mojave Desert. And I've had to struggle. And it's been for the glory of God. People, people have gotten saved. And it's nothing like, you know, they're not going to put me in, you know, sword of the Lord or nothing. But <laughs> people have gotten saved, man, out there in this desert, you know. And, and it's just like, I know God has used me Amen. because I've gotten under their skin and they let me know. Don't do that. <laughs> Don't do that. You know, and, uh, and now, you know, the Lord has blessed us and we, we got a good group of folks and, and, you know, we're starting to look for a place and if the Lord open up the door, yeah. I'm, you pray for me, with me, yes. you know, that we're just trying to just get a storefront. And, and it, Brother Walker was saying, well, it, it seems like God's going to put you in a point where you need to maybe take a little leap of faith there. Okay. And I'm like, I agree. I agree. You know, and, and just sometimes you're, you, you get so paralyzed with fear, you know, and, and it's not about being ridiculously stupid, but I, I know that God can do something. You know, I, I'm not jumping off a cliff saying, catch me, Jesus. You know, it's not like that. But, but I mean, with, with that lamp, you can only see so far, right? And you, you got to be willing to take another step, you know, and, and, and that's what, what God wants out of you and me. You know, but um, so we see there's a parable with a point, a practical picture, and then we see a plain petition. And this widow just simply says, Avenge me of mine adversary. Now, we all seek retribution, don't we? We're seeking for it. We have an adversary called the devil, don't we? I mean, has he not robbed you of something? Has he not stolen something from you? You know, I mean. There, there's a lot of ages here, and I, I don't uh, <laughs> I need to watch what I'm saying here, but the Lord has stolen things from you that you'll never get back. You know, and, and 
you might have to apologize on your wedding day. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Amen? <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> you know, and, and the devil has stolen things from you, but God can restore. Amen? <laughs> and, and you could be placed back on the foundation of Jesus Christ and His righteousness through the blood of Jesus. And if you believe that, amen? You know, maybe none of the brethren will say amen to that, but I'm going to say amen to that! Jesus Christ restored me! I was sticking on drugs for six years. I blew my mind, man. And I can read. (laughs) How can I even read? How can I go to work? How can I pay a bill? I don't know. It's just God restoring me. And, and, and he's still working on me. <laughs> Ask my wife. <laughs> he's still working on me. But the devil has devoured something in all of our lives. Look at uh, 1 Peter 5. Hang on right. Go to 1 Peter 5. First Peter 5, and look at verse 8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. We have a devouring adversary, and he'll devour whatever you hand to him. Whatever you hand to him. Your, your children? Sure, thank you. Gobble, gobble, gobble. You know? Oh, your marriage. Oh, Wow, thank you. This is like dessert. Gobble, gobble, gobble. Oh, your, your time with Jesus. Oh, I'd, be, I'd love to help you with that. Gobble, gobble, gobble. He's a devouring adversary. And then hang a left, go to John 10.10. 10. It says, The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. And I mean, I'm sure we could just stop the service right now and we could probably just do testimonies the rest of the, of, of the camp and probably even longer about things that the devil has uh, stolen, uh, people he's killed and things he's destroyed in your life. Luke 12.33 talks about you needing to put a treasure in the heavens that faileth not, where no thief approacheth, neither moth corrupt. You know, it's been said like this, one life will soon be passed, only what's done for Christ will last. And we'll amen that, but we're not living that. You know, we're, we're building our kingdom here. You know, or maybe it's your household, maybe it's your career, maybe it's what, I mean, whatever you're, you're up to something. I don't know what you're up to, you know, but the thing is, you need to put those treasures in heaven because the devil can devour these things. He's going to destroy these things. And I mean, what are you going to leave for the Antichrist? You're going to leave something, you're going to leave something for the Antichrist? Hey, gobble, gobble, gobble. You know, I mean, I mean, in Europe right now, you, you know where the Muslims like to make their mosques? Because it's old, old, closed Christian churches. Gobble, gobble, gobble. You want to give it up? Okay, hey, we'll take it. Gobble, gobble, gobble. And that's a shame. So number two, so number one, we looked at parable of purpose, and there's a lot of purpose in this. But number two, there's a parable of patience here. We're back in Luke 18. Look at verse 4 and 5. And he would not for a while, but afterwards said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. And I want you to notice it said, And he would not for a while. You know, when listening to the wrong preachers um, coming up, I wasn't always a Baptist. I didn't always have a King James Bible. Uh, even as a saved individual, you know, that's our accusation. We, we think that you can't get saved without a King James Bible. That's a lie, by the way, you know, because if they don't understand you, they got to throw dirt, you know, and they won't spend the five minutes to understand that. I mean, I'll, I'll just be honest. The first time I ever went to a Baptist church, you know, I went back to my punk rock band, my Christian punk rock band, and they're like, bro, so they're a cult, bro? Like, tell us, like, what kind of cult are they? And I was like, honestly? I've never heard a clearer gospel presentation. You, you, know what, you know what the critique of Baptists has, has been through, throughout the ages? Is they take that Bible a little bit too serious. 
that's what that's what your critique has always been. Amen. We 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 need to fall in form, lock and step with that. You know, you're you're gonna call. Maybe you don't call yourself a Baptist. I mean, being a Baptist don't save you. Jesus saves you, right? But I'm a Baptist. I want to be accused of the same thing, taking that book a little bit too serious. Amen. I was a fanatic for the devil, man. I I would wake up early in the morning. I'd stay up late at night. I'd ride my bicycle because God knew that I couldn't have a car. (laughs) Amen. He was just like, no, 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 no car for this one. I had a bicycle. And I had my skateboard on, on the uh, on the on the you know the bars there because I'd b- probably be skating wherever we went, you know. But I mean, I would ride that bike for miles and miles and miles for what? For the devil? Yeah. Right, right. For the devil. And it's like shame on me if I'm not going to try to attempt something crazy for God. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yes. That's right. But when listening to wrong preachers, you know, I, I got under this idea that God would not hear. Uh, the prayer of the sinner before he got saved. It's being preached out there by somebody. I, I heard it from somebody. And I was under the, this presupposition and that's all it was. You know, and, and I started thinking about that and, and you know, we, we lost a, a portion of our church over the sinner's prayer. Now, the sinner's prayer is a lot of stuff on YouTube about it. You know, just totally like, you can't get saved by the sinner's prayer. And it's just like, it's become a trigger word. You know, when people are mind controlled, you know, when the word pops, they pop, you know. They pop, they pop, they pop. Like, you know, you know and if you say racist, that's a mind control word that, that you, have been, you have been pre-programmed to pop at that. You know, but when you say uh, racial distinctions, you know, then it's like, like, it's different. Like, they, they don't get it, you know? It's like, it, look, when, when I go to eat Mexican food, I want to get it from a Mexican. I don't want no white woman making my Mexican food. It's, I don't want mayonnaise. <laughs> just joking. Just joking. That's a white joke. If you, we put mayonnaise in everything, apparently. I learned that from a Mexican. <laughs> But, you know, uh, I, I, I was thinking about that, and it, they call it the sinner's prayer. You're not going to find that phrase in the Bible. You know, that doesn't mean it's not biblical. So you know what I did? I just flipped it around, and I call it the prayer of a sinner. And then everyone's like, ah. It's like, you didn't even realize what just happened. See, I mean, if God doesn't hear any prayers of a sinner before they get saved, you understand they could never even pray to get saved? There is no salvation. And there's so many inconsistencies with that. We could do a series for weeks. I mean, you could list uh, Ahab in 1 Kings 21, 29. Wicked man gets a prayer answered. Uh, Jehoahaz in 2 Kings 13, 1 through 4. Wicked man gets a prayer answered. What, what, about, a, what about a whole country, Nineveh? Yeah. Wicked place. They get their prayer answered. <laughs> you know? God is not willing that any should perish, but that all come to what? Repentance. Amen. Amen. And that's his heart is to help you. And if he's willing to help some wicked country, some wicked kings, how much more would he be willing to help you? Are you his child if you're born again? Aren't you his child? Let me hear it. We're not to be ashamed. But with this parable of patience, what do we see? We see no reply. We see no reply. And you know, th- this widow, she would have every reason in the world to just quit. To say, I asked. I put it in writing. It had letterhead. I mean, I had it legally certified and documented. I did everything they told me to do. He never replied. You know, I don't know what your need is today, but you're probably going to have to ask more than once. Yes. And, and it's not because God is like not willing to help you out, but He wants to see your seriousness. Yes. You know, uh, maybe it is for a sibling to get saved or a parent to get saved. I mean, you're probably going to have to ask God more than once. Yes. You know, you, you might have to share with them more than once. It might even get to the point where they don't want to hear it anymore from you. And then what? All you have is prayer from there. Yes. That's all you have at that point. God has other people He can send them. You know what I'm saying? And, and I've seen God do that in my family members' lives. You know, where, where lo and behold, you know, somebody comes out and they're like, I'm a Christian. I'm like, 
And you're friends with dot, dot, dot? Like, but they're a Christian. And I'm like, what's God doing? He's got undercover people. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And they're just slipping in there. And God is trying to get His will accomplished. Because the thing is, anybody that goes to hell, you understand they got to go through so many red flags to get there, so many warnings that God placed there, that, that every mouth will be shut. Yes. It's going to be to the point where, no, I'm going to hell because I didn't want you, God. Yes. And now I see it's clear. So there, there's a, look at 1 John 3 there. 1 John 3, we're, we're talking about no reply. 1 John 3, and look at verse 20. For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. You know, sometimes, sometimes you'll look at that no reply and you think there's something wrong. And may, there very well might be. But I mean, bring your complaints to God. Bring your complaint. Don't let your heart and your, your guilt and your depression, like in all this junk that's trying to get in the way of you and God, don't let it stop your prayers. You know, um, I remember before I was saved, I mean, I would lay on the bed drunk at night and I would look at the ceiling. Everything's spinning. And I felt like I was falling into hell. I just felt like I was falling into hell. I was like, God, I don't want to go to hell. I don't want to go. I didn't even know what to say. It's just, I knew if I died right then, I'd burn. <laughs> that's, a, that's a scary question, you know, for, for someone on drugs. Like, if you died tonight, where you? Yeah, I'd go to hell, man. <laughs> You know, I mean, I, I've been on substances and things and certain substances they don't recommend that you ever look in a mirror. And, and I did it. And I looked in a mirror and I just felt God's hand. Kind of like a thou art the men kind of thing. But you ready to die? And I'm trying to puke myself by the toilet just to sober up. But the, that only helps with alcohol. It doesn't help with substances. And, and it's not helping. And I'm just like, God, I know if I die like this, I'm going to burn. I don't want to go to hell. But sometimes that no reply is testing your heart. And sometimes that thing, you got to get through it. And I don't know how to... I don't know how to come into your heart and, and inject power into your chest. I can't do it. I don't, I don't carry stuff in here anymore, you know? But, but I can tell you if you pray, God will help you. Yes. You know, Amen. because when you leave this, you got all the brethren here. We're all on your side. Amen. Yeah. We're cheering on. Yeah. We're cheering you on. We're on your side. But you're going to go home and you're going to be alone again. Yes. And you need to buy a con Dios. You need to go with God. You need them. And, and you know, uh, you need a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, even a Christian. You get me? Yeah. You get saved. Amen. That's great. And, and that's, a, that's, you make one good decision in your life. You get saved. Amen. Yeah. Amen. That's, hey, I made one good decision yeah. in my life. Yeah. I chose to accept Jesus Christ and trust the death, burial, and the resurrection alone to save me. And amen. That, yeah. that is something that can never be undone. Yeah. But now it's time for the relationship, amen. for the growth. Yes. Amen. For the learning. But what, what else do we see in our text in Luke 18 is we see no regard. You know, and this judge, he's bragging about how he has no regard for God or man. And you know what our problem with no regard is? We don't regard prayer. We don't even regard prayer. You know, and how many times, and I don't think there's a seat or anybody in this house that can say there's not a time that you look back and we're like, I should have prayed about that. You know, and we're not asking for a raising of hands or produce a list on, on the whiteboard, but you know it's true. Yes. You know it's true. Yes. Where, where God will tap on your shoulder. Have you thought to pray? 
Have you thought to pray about this? Oh, well, yeah, I mean, I talked to everybody in my church. I talked to some pastors. You know, I updated my Facebook with it. And it's just like, and God's sitting there like, you never even asked. So there's no reply, there's no regard, and then no relief. And the judge, what he starts seeing with this lady is she ain't going to stop. She ain't going to stop. It's a wicked judge, and for all we know, this is some wicked woman. Amen. But she's smart. She's going to try to get... I was going to start making jokes about the continual drop-in, but uh, <clears throat> we'll just skip that. But, you, you know, the, the thing... I know. <laughs> Maybe they didn't catch it. <laughs> but do you understand that your faith can prove the fact? You know, that, that atheist, he's like, you, you have no proof. You have no proof. And I was like, I'm the proof. I'm the proof. I mean, I, I can be proved uh, in a scientific laboratory. Amen. I, I mean, I could take interviews from high school people that told me I should be dead because I had a hit on me. Amen. And I joked about it saying, oh, it must not have been for very much. You know, and God smote me and he said, no, I saved your life when you got saved. Those guys thought you were, weren't that you weren't a threat anymore. And I'm more of a threat! Amen. I'm more of a threat now! I'm coming with the Lord Jesus Christ! I'm coming for your children! Amen. I'm coming for your mother! <laughs> you know? I want to lead your spouse to Christ! <laughs> they think I'm not a threat anyway. Jesus didn't defang me, man. <laughs> then I'm like, what would Gene say here? You know, because he always has some like really good thing. And, and I, I don't know, bro, and this may be just me thinking, but this seems like a Gene-ism, you know? He'd say, give them heaven! <laughs> <You know? laughs> Give me a fan to run around. <laughs> but we need to give this world no relief. Amen. We need to be where they would expect us to be. You know, and I've always thought about this, and I'm, I'm trying to. We got good preachers in this room, and if you guys could develop this, this would be a good message. Christianity as defined by your neighbor. Yeah, and you can ask your neighbor, so, all right, Mr. Neighbor, all right, you know, and they're just, just regular Joe, you know, and you're just interviewing them. Should Christians smoke cigarettes? Oh, no. No, no. Of course not. You think a Christian should? No. Okay, well, I mean, should they be able to drink alcohol in moderation? <laughs> no! A Christian drinking alcohol? Are you stupid? You know, well, okay, well, how about the periodic curse word? You know, just... You, you know, just conversational. You know. No! 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 <laughs> right? <laughs> we need to give them no relief. You know, when they expect you to be on that street corner, we should be there. When they expect you to be, uh, uh, for us, at that track table, we need to be there. You know, when they expect you to be knocking on, we need to be there. I mean, whatever it is, I mean, what, you think your neighbor would expect you to pray over your meals? I mean, I don't think that's very big. I think that's kind of like, isn't that like 101 level? Like Christianity 101. Before you eat, thank God for your meal. Yeah. You know, and it, it's humbling to have a seven-year-old. Like, did we pray? Yeah. Oh, um, yeah. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> Amen. Being a parent will humble you. Amen. Amen. But it's a parable of patience. And this patience we need to understand is that you might not get your answer the first time. And you need to have patience with the Lord. You know, sometimes He's moving chess pieces that you could not even imagine what's going on behind the scenes. And, and, and He doesn't want you to cut that line of communication. You know, uh, uh, we got plenty of parents in here. You know, and I couldn't imagine... What would it be like to have my child stop talking to me? 
I couldn't imagine that. I mean, and I don't want that. You know, and, and I, I've, I've seen in different situations, you know, where maybe a child kind of goes wayward and stuff, but that parent tries to keep that line of communication open, right? Just anything. I just want to hear your voice. Yes. Let me know you're alive. And that's just some earthly, fallen, from Adam, I mean, wicked human race. How much more of a holy God who is willing to die for His creation? How much more? And then thirdly, we find a parable of principle. We're back in Luke 18, verse 6. And it says, And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge saith. And shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, uh, though he bear long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? You know, this whole parable, it's a worse situation than you'll ever be in if you're a Christian. You understand that courtroom is open to you every day of every minute of every second of every day? I mean... That, that judge, I mean, has, I mean, his, his little candy jar right there, you know, just for his kid to come up whenever they want to walk in that place and grab a little candy, you know, and sit on Papa's lap. I mean, I mean it's, it's like that. Yes. And God is leaving that door open for you. Thank you, Lord. You can walk into the Holy of Holies anytime you want. And I brought up the example before, but I think it bears repeating. You know, if, if we were to meet some Old Testament saint and they're like, you know, uh, you're interviewing them, you're like, oh, so what, what was your relationship with God like? They're like, oh, man, we had to travel sometimes to go to the temple. We had to do all these feasts and, you know, eat certain ways and wear certain clothes and do all this stuff. And, man, it was, it was like, it was a lot, you know, but God's worth it, you know. And, and we were a peculiar people. And, you know, uh, some of our people, just because we were different, they were slaughtered and all this stuff. And we'd, we'd follow the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. And it was, it was scary out there. And, and, you know, we were just hoping, you know, that when Moses went up there to see God, that he'd come down. We, th- we didn't know if he'd die. You know, we didn't know, like, all these stipulations that they had. And, and then they'd be like, so what was your relationship with God like? You know, we, you know our, us Old Testament saints, we were talking about it and like, you know, we heard you guys had an open door to the Holy of Holies at all times. Yet you must have been a praying fool. And then could you imagine, you know, we shrug in shyness. You know, just God, I didn't pray like I should have. I didn't keep the phone line up like I should have. You know, Jesus was always trying to reach out to me and I didn't always answer. You know, could, could you imagine having that conversation? It's going to happen. Yeah. You're going to give a cow. <laughs> you understand that? Yeah, come on, <laughs> you know, but this parable here is, is dark and dreary as it really is. It's a worse ses- uh, situation than a Christian will ever experience. You know, you aren't going to an unjust judge. Right. You're going to the King of Kings. Yeah. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> You know, uh, you were going to the King of Kings, the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end, and the, the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, every tongue should confess. Amen? Yes. I mean, you are going to, to, you are going to the, the deal maker. Amen? I mean, you're, you're going to the capo. You know I mean? You, I mean, he's the shot caller. Amen? I mean, that's where you're going. You don't have to go to some unjust judge. You know, you go to that King of Kings, you know, you're never uninvited. Ever. Ever. And I mean, maybe the brethren have uninvited you. Amen. And it's not unheard of, right? It's, oh yeah, this is real. This is real. You mean these angels would do that? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. You ruffled up brothers, you're going to see. Amen. But you know what? When a man's ways please the Lord, he'll make even his enemies to be at peace with them. Amen. And sometimes those enemies are the brethren. And you need to love them and pray for them anyway. How about that? Yes. How about that? Look at Hebrews 7.
Hebrews 7, and look at verse 25. And it says, Wherefore, He, Jesus Christ, is able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by Him, seeing He ever liveth to make intercession for them. You understand, this is one of the purposes that He's going to live forever. You. You. Your problems. To bring your prayers to God the Father. He is existing in heaven at the right hand of the throne of glory for you. Don't put him out of business. Don't put him out of business. This is part of his job. This is in the, it's in the job description. You're going to ever live it to make an intercession for Randy Gorski. Well, I'm going to keep him busy then. I, 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 I need some intercession on some things. Amen? Amen? I've said some things I shouldn't have said. I've done some things I shouldn't have done. Amen? And there's some people that I still want to go to heaven. And I want to keep my Jesus busy. Yeah. Amen? <laughs> but this parable of principle, what do we find? That God's protection is awarded. You know, when you're on God's side, you know one man plus God is the majority? Yes. It's cliche now, isn't it? We say it all the time. Yeah. One man and God's a majority. No, that's like real. Like you could literally be alone in a jail cell surrounded by a bunch of felons. And I mean, there's been crazier things that happen. You know, I hear about J. Frank Norris, you know, jumping up on the, on the roof of a car and he starts preaching to a bunch of guys that want to kill him and they get saved. Amen. What? Amen. <laughs> crazier things have happened. I'm just telling you, do you, how big is your God? I don't know. I don't know. Well, is he going to help me with my math test? <laughs> I mean, and maybe that's the thing you're biting your nails about. God wants to help you. Yes. Amen. He wants to help. You know, he can bring things back to remembrance. It's a good prayer to pray. You know, I, I mean, we try to study. Don't be dumb about it. Try to study. You know, but when it comes test day, pray. You know? So God's protection is awarded. And when you're his child... He takes you very seriously. When you're His child, the things that come into your life and things that people do to you at the workplace and even at your own church, amen, and on your street and on your block, God takes that stuff very personally. Wow. You know, uh, we hear about Carl Lackey kicking the bride, you know, up and down the aisle. And, and I mean, uh, Brother Walker probably more familiar with the story. I'm, I, I just hear it third, fourth, fifth party, but you know, apparently he had a mannequin dressed up like a bride, and the bride is supposed to be Jesus Christ, and he's kicking her up and down the aisles, you know, about how Christians treat Christians. You know, why are we known for shooting our wounded? Why are there brethren that were in the mission field? They took their family to the mission field, and the devil devoured them. Why won't the brother even give him a call? Come on. Oh, they got problems. You got problems. Amen. You got problems. Amen. If your Christianity ain't, ain't big enough to make a stinking call, forgive us, Lord. Forgive us, Lord. We repent in sackcloth and ashes. Forgive us, Jesus. We've forgotten about our brethren. We've shot them when they were down. Amen. I don't want to be that guy anymore. Amen, brother. I want to be a Barnabas, man. Amen. I want to reel him back in. Yeah. I want to bring him back in, man. Yes. Randy, you're spitting. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> 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 But you know what? There's a God's prompt answer. You know, an answer to prayer, because that's what we want. We want answers to our prayers. When, when we kneel in prayer before a service and we say, God, would you bless this service? We sit back in that chair and we're waiting for God to bless the service. Amen. We want an answer. Yes. Right? And the three answers are yes, no, and wait. And when I'm up here, it's probably saying wait. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just wait. Wait, Pastor Stevenson will fix all of this. <laughs> but guess what? Guess what? Guess what? Answers to prayer require action. 
You want God to really answer your prayer? You understand much who, to whom much is given, much is what? Required. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Because, I mean, we're asking a lot. Yeah. And God's like, you know what? You, you want that family member to get saved? I'm going to put you in a real awkward situation in front of the whole family. And I'm going to make that guy say, so where am I going when I die? No, go ahead, big shot, big street preacher. Tell me, where am I going when I die? Are you going to say something? You better say it with tears in your eyes. That's right, brother. God wants to answer your prayers, but don't be surprised if he comes knocking on your door and wants something from you. Amen. He'll give you some answers, but he's going to expect you to come up to the next level. Amen. I mean, you just think about the stories in here of how God has moved in all of our lives individually. You know, Brother Max and his sister, just even where they lived, like I'm just trying to like compartmentalize that in my head. How are they in a church camp right now? You know, and just you, you got your stories. I got mine. And it's just it's a miracle we're even here. But you understand like God is going to require that out of all of us. You know, some people in here were in a legit cult. In a legit, real cult. And now they're here. Amen. How does that happen? Amen. How does that, that, that's, that's illogical. It doesn't happen in the real world. It Amen. does happen when people are praying. Amen. You understand? Then God's promise. I'm, I'm sorry. We, we saw God's protection awarded, God's prompt answer, and God's problem asked. And at the end of our text here in verse 8, it says this. I tell you, um, actually at the end, it says, Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, in verse 8, shall he find faith on the earth? You know, prayer is an act of faith. It really is. You know, and, and that's why the sinner's prayer, oh, I'm sorry, the prayer of a sinner, <laughs> that's why people get saved. Uh, sorry, I triggered somebody. Yeah. <laughs> you, know, you know, but... That's why when you bow your head in prayer and you close your eyes and you don't see a thing, do you? And, and you start talking, whether it be in your heart, in your mind, or audibly, and no one's in the room. And you are by faith expecting God to hear your prayers. It's faith. You know, every time you bow your head and pray for that unsaved loved one, that's faith. And God's looking at that like, I like that. I like that. You know? And maybe the answer is just wait. How about that? I mean, I'm not a Pentecostal, man, but we need to have more faith. You know what I'm saying? I think God can do more than He has for me. That's what I think. You know, I, I, I think... I, I, and I'm not into this, like, I believe it's applied with my works and all this junk that God will do. No, like, I think if I just trust God, He can do something more for me. You know, and oh, well, Randy, are you only in it for you? I, I am in it to see what God can do for me. I am. But I am promising to return whatever he does for me back to him. Amen. Because in, in, a, in, a, in a life like mine, in a, in a body like mine with a face only a mother can love, you know, <laughs> God knows it wasn't Randy Gorski. Amen. <laughs> Let me read you something here. I got this from the You Don't Know Jack book. Amen, Jack Chick? You know, Jack, uh, Jack Chick was known to be a man of prayer. And like most of these men of God that we still talk about today, yeah. they were known to be men of prayer. That's right. Billy Sunday, I mean, just down the line. But J this is about Jack Chick. You know, Jack Chick, uh, he prayed um, about this. Former uh, ex, uh, he was a former priest that he had actually hired. Now, uh, he would hire people that came out of the occult. He would hire people that were like ex-witches and like they would get saved and he'd hire them and give them a chance. But this guy was an ex-priest. And he, he was praying one day because every day, you know, David W. Daniels is telling me that they actually, they, they learned that they had to stop their company and take this time of prayer in the morning because their, their sales and, every, and production would drop if they didn't stop to pray. Now, now, you can call him and, and double-check me, triple-check me, but I believe it. 
I believe it, man. You know, but so Jack Chick, he was known for being a man of prayer, and, and he was praying about this man Lee, this, this former priest that was working for him. And one day Jack walked up to Lee and said to him, the Lord told me you'll betray me. And he walked away. And that man's jaw hit the floor. He didn't even say nothing. But he had that how do you know look. Not long after that, Lee just disappeared. He was exposed. Now, I, I don't think Jack Chick, if he were alive, would say that he had some burning bush in his office or something. But you know, God can help you. You need guidance? Pray. You know, you need wisdom above what you have normally? Pray. God wants to give that to you. You know, sometimes He could just move things around and yeah. you didn't even know what happened, but you, you got by, you know? There's much more that we can learn from Jesus, amen? Much more we can learn from these parables. Much more we can learn when we're still rightly dividing the Word of God, but we can take practical applications, amen? And we can bring it to every Scripture. I mean, hasn't God ever talked to you in the Psalms? The Proverbs, yes. Job, yes. I mean, God wants to talk to you today. But the thing is, He's not going to, let me say it like this, God wants that communication line open. What's He going to have to do to keep that thing open? Let's go ahead and stand.